Hi, this is Tony Byrne. Welcome to this week's show, Money Demystified, the show to make your money grow. Every Tuesday at 5 p.m. here on Spectrum On Air, the colour of radio. Today's special guest is uh, Jim Mellon. We're going to be talking about a variety of interesting subjects, uh, mainly covering uh, investments and in particularly uh, interesting sectors such as clean meat and longevity. I'd just like to introduce you to our guest today, who is Jim Mellon, who is a highly successful entrepreneur, investor, author, public speaker, visionary, and bon viveur. I hope you find that a, a reasonable description of you, Jim. Well, I, I, I think uh, it's very generous. I'm certainly uh, fond of uh, bon viveuring, but whether the rest is true or not, I'll leave to you. But I appreciate the intro, Tony. Very nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Jim, I've, I've heard you speak many times at Master Investor um, in, in Islington, London, uh, at the Master Investor show every year. But I've always been intrigued to know a bit more about you because I'm, I'm, maybe you're just quite a private person. But could you tell us a little bit about your background, um, growing up, your family, uh, your education, those kind of things, just get a little bit of a, a view of what, where you're from and what you're about. Okay, all right. Um, so I was born in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, and my dad was a British diplomat. Wow. And uh, so uh, after the year, one year, I was, uh, we moved to, we started moving around actually, and uh, so Denmark, West Africa, um, and a whole series of other places until he retired at the age of 60 and then went on to do other stuff. He's still with us at the age of 92. Um, and because we moved around uh, and because the Foreign Office paid for it, I was sent to a boarding school um, in England, which is called Ampleforth, which is famous for reasons I'm sure that they would prefer not to be famous <laughs> um, in Yorkshire, very Catholic school. Uh -huh. And from there, I went to university um, at Oxford and, and uh, there were good old days, you know, the late, well, the very late 1970s and um, I, uh, there were plenty of jobs on offer and the one that I chose when I left university was to go to Hong Kong. I didn't really know what the business did. Um, I soon found out it was a small fund management business called GT Management. It still goes on under the name LGT now. Um, it, it grew very, very quickly. I was in Hong Kong uh, for a period, and then they sent me to San Francisco, where I lived for four years. And uh, towards the end of those four years, Richard Thornton, who was my boss, who'd given me my chance, and he was the T in the GT management, was fired by his own company because he was a very erratic and uh, mercurial, difficult-to-work-with character. And there I was at the age of 25, and no one else would go with him. So I went with him. <laughs> um, and I went back to Hong Kong and I became the managing director at a very early age of his business, uh, which was called Thornton management. And, um, in exchange for that, I got 10% of the business and, uh, four years later it was sold to a German bank for cash. And, and so at the quite early age, I got two and a half million pounds, which was a lot of money in those days. And, um, I bought my house in Ibiza, which I still have. I bought a house in London, which I don't have. We bought a new place here. Um, and I had enough money to go off and start my own business with my uh, long-standing colleague, Jane Sutcliffe, uh, which was called Regent Pacific. It's still called Regent Pacific. And uh, it branched, a branch of it became Charlemagne Capital, which was bought, float, it was floated and bought and blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, so I was a fund manager in all those years, uh, investing in the Far East and U.S. technology companies. And then in, uh, we found Eastern Europe uh, in 1994 and built quite a good business there. Uh, but, but, but by then, I, you know, by the year 2000, I'd made enough money to do whatever I wanted to do, really. And so I, um, I've been investing in a whole load of uh, stuff since then, as you, you guys know. And uh, so it's ranged from mining to 
uh, to biotech, pharmaceuticals, uh, and most recently, uh, um, with your support and others, longevity um, and uh, clean meat, which is, you know, trying to change the world's food supply so that it doesn't endanger human health in the way that it currently does. So a kind of wide variety of stuff. Um, and it just seems like yesterday that I started, but of course it was a long time ago. It was uh, 40 years ago, uh, yeah, almost 40 years ago. And um, uh, uh, a lot's happened uh, since then. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the trajectory of time going faster and faster as you get older, but that's certainly the way I feel. Absolutely, Jim. I, I, I'm a similar age to you, and uh, it, it's amazing how each year goes by faster and faster. I totally agree. No, it's so awful. Thanks, yeah, thanks for those answers, because you've actually stayed me having to ask you about five questions, <laughs> because you've given me oh, good, good. <laughs> quite a good history there. <laughs> the downside is this show might be over sooner than we thought. Um, uh, I'm sure we'll I, find lots to talk about. Jim, I've read some of your books, um, uh, and uh, the very interesting one I read of yours called Wake Up. Now, I read it many years after the great financial crisis of 2008, but you uh, were visionary enough um, to write a book in 2005 predicting the global financial crisis, which actually happened in 2008. I find that remarkable, and I find it very interesting that you were able to come up with that kind of forecast. Now, Jim, are you a bit of a clairvoyant, or would you rather describe yourself as just purely visionary? Well, I'm neither, actually, Tony, but it's very nice of you to suggest either of those things. But I think, you know, my motto, uh, for what it's worth, and I'm actually going to write a book about it, is that we all have to be curious, so we have to understand or know something of the world that's around us. Uh, we have to be adaptable, particularly in a world that's changing so quickly, uh, you know, just remarkably quickly. And um, then we have to have application, which is just a long word for hard work. And I think that those are the three things that stand me in good stead. So I read a lot. Um, I hope I'm adaptable. You can see that I've changed, you know, tack in what I do and what I invest in and uh, several times over my career. And I, yes. I imagine I'll do more of that, hopefully, if I'm still alive. And then uh, application, well, I... You know, like you, I get up uh, very early in the morning, go for a, a long walk, and uh, then I, I end up starting work way before most people. Um, and actually, I finish work way before most people, but I think in the early parts of the day, you can get so much more done. And um, so, uh, you know, I work hard, and there isn't a day in which I don't work. So, uh, you know, we, I, I never take a day off, ever. Wow. Wow, amazing. Well, I thought I was hard working. You're putting me to shame now. <laughs> um, Jim, I keep referring to this visionary side of you. Now, I appreciate you've got those three uh, aspects of your life that you use to, to become successful, but not everybody's got a vision in them, in my experience. And, and I think I share that with you, although you're clearly far more successful than I'll ever be. But nonetheless, I do find that I have in common with you. I, I really like that. So... What do you think helps you to be able to uh, spot what you call early money fountain ideas? How, how are you able to do that? What is it about your personality that enables you to spot things earlier than most other people? Well, first of all, I would say that, uh, you know, it's not entirely clear that uh, you haven't done as well as me, and I'm sure that uh, we'll be level pegging in the future, um, and hopefully, and both successfully. Um, but I, I would say that I've got a very uh, heuristic mind, so I can triage, or in other words, I can sift through stuff very quickly. Uh, so if you gave me a pile of papers to look at, I would quickly know which ones were worth reading and which ones were just not worth reading and throw them away. And that comes from years of doing this. Um, when I was a fund manager stroke analyst, in the old days, they used to give you all the research in paper. Now it's all online, of course. Yes. Um, but we used to have a pile of paper, you know, almost to the ceiling on a daily basis that came in. And I just became very adept at throwing... Uh, I mean, I don't know how many trees were destroyed in the process, but throwing 
a lot of uh, paper away and knowing which was the one that I needed to focus on and which I didn't. And I think that serves me well. So, I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. So in 1994, the internet didn't really exist. In fact, I don't remember using the internet then. I don't think any of us would actually. But uh, I did a lot of reading. And one of the things I saw was that in an obscure uh, magazine or research newsletter was that Russia was privatizing its uh, state industries and foreigners could invest in the process. And that gave me the idea of, of us going to Russia and uh, starting to invest there. Uh, and it was a you know big success, at least it was for the first four or five years. And uh, you know most, in fact, there were very, very few Westerners who picked up on that. But that was because of reading and being able to sift very quickly. And then the second, uh, most recently, has been this um, clean agriculture or growing meats, products, dairy products, etc., fish in laboratory conditions. And you know, by reading uh, and understanding the biotech process that underlies all this stuff. Um, we were very early to the party, and now we're the world's largest investors in the in the area. That's just up to two years. So, read, 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 and try and you know separate the wheat from the chaff when you do read, and you'll become more and more practiced at it as you read more. And don't be afraid to read. I mean, I don't I don't think people should go and read conspiracy theories or obscure dark web type of stuff, but just read stuff that you're interested in. And something will come along, not necessarily a money fountain, but you might find, find that you are attracted to someone else's money fountain, which will be just as good. Yes. Thanks, Jim. That's really fantastic insight. We've got a keen interest on them because we run a fund, the, C the CCM Insurgent Wealth Fund, and we're invested in both of your companies with, with these projects. So what can you tell us about those, those um, sectors? Uh, delighted to do so, and thank you both for... Um, being such early and keen supporters of the uh, two things that I think are very important for not just investors, but also to make an impact on all of us as human beings. Uh, the first is the science of longevity. And, you know, if you go back thousands of years, Tony, uh, people have wanted to live longer, and it's just not been possible. It's not been possible because it has appeared as if there is a an upper limit to uh, life uh, expectancy. Uh, about 20 years ago, something called the human genome, which is really the map of our bodily makeup, um, you know, all the cells, the connections, the pathways, etc., was unveiled. And as time has gone on, the ability to read that map, which you might imagine as a great big, huge bit of paper that's lying on your floor, but incomprehensible to begin with but as time goes on you're able to read it better and better with better computers uh, more collaboration between scientists etc scientists have worked out that actually we're not destined to die at a particular age that what happens is that our bodies lose what's known as homeostasis which is years old that homeostasis is lost in increasing quantities and the instability, a bit rather like a top that's spinning uh, on a table, uh, which loses momentum, the instability results in us just, you know, falling over and dying of something. And typically we die of cancer or of heart disease or of dementia, uh, diabetes, stroke, obesity. And most people, 70% of people die of those diseases and most people if they make it to 65 will live to about 90 uh, given current uh, conditions but it's clear um, as the years have gone on that those pathways that lead us to instability or lack of homeostasis are uh, are fixable you know that they, they they can be altered so that life expectancy can be extended and even more importantly perhaps that healthy life expectancy so rather than being sick at the end of your life which most people are and you know it's for, for most people old age is not necessarily a pleasant process um you can be much more robust 
and you can avoid frailty and all the horrible diseases of aging. And so the mission of Juvenescence and other companies like it is to try and, number one, increase healthy lifespan, so have less of a period of illness at the end of life, and two, to add some extra years to our lifespans. And, and you know, in, although we're in a very early stage of this science, there are remarkable things happening. So people are able to regenerate organs uh, in the body. There are some pills that you can take or will be able to take that will undoubtedly have a pro-longevity effect. Um, there are personalized exercise and diet programs that will enable you to live healthier and possibly for longer. Um, so there are good things happening. Um, and I think in about 10 years time, the capacity for us to live routinely to 110 or 120 will absolutely be there. And it's not terribly surprising that this is happening because the three of us, if we'd been born in 1900, would have had an average life expectancy in the UK, would have had an average life expectancy of about 47. Today, our life expectancy is well into the 80s, uh, notwithstanding COVID and all those sort of things. So uh, that's nearly a doubling in the space of 120 years. So it is entirely possible that another 50% of life expectancy can be achieved uh, over the next two or three decades. And it will be revolutionary for everyone. Uh, and it will be, you know, it will change everything. Finances, the way we live our lives, the notion that we are just born to earn, to learn, to retire and to expire will be out the window. It will be a very different trajectory of life. So watch this space on, on Juvenescence, and I know that you follow it very closely, and we're a very early supporter, for which, as I said, we're very, very grateful. So that, that's number one. And if you want me to go into number two, I'd be happy to do that. Yes, tell us more about Agronomics, which is your clean meat company. We're living in this terrible pandemic, and it's not over yet. And, you know, the government's forecasting maybe 100,000 cases of oh, a day by next month or something like that. I mean, admittedly, the vaccinations are are helping to mitigate the effects of it, and that's a fantastic thing. But where did this pandemic come from? Well, it came from food mal or agricultural malpractice, largely out of the Far East. And the previous pandemics, the swine flu, the avian flu ones, the MERS and all those ones, come from the same place agricultural malpractice and this is because farmed animals have become increasingly intensively reared so uh, they are packed together in very small uh, cages or feedlots or whatever they live pretty awful lives as you know um, and in order to stop disease uh, because they're so closely packed together farmers feed them antibiotics and four-fifths of all antibiotic use in the world goes into farmed animals so chickens cows pigs ducks uh sheep whatever you name it um they're dosed up to the eyeballs with um antibiotics to stop them from spreading disease now the problem is that those antibiotics are eaten by human beings because they go back into the food supply and uh, the pandemic we have at the moment is a, what's called a viral pandemic, and uh, it's pretty bad. But if we had a bacterial pandemic where the antibiotics, because so many of them have been abused and used in vast quantities in the food supplies, that we become resistant to antibiotics, then God help us all. So that's one very important reason why we have to do something about the food supply. The second is that the intensive farming that I mentioned is the biggest source of emissions on the planet, more than transport, more than home heating or anything like that. Mm. Uh, because cows burp, uh, as you know, and uh, all the other animals emit methane, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so we need to do something about climate change. I think we all agree that. And one of the easy ways, one fifth of emissions come from intensive farming is to try and reduce the amount of 
intensively farmed um, animals uh, on the planet. And uh, additionally, the seas are being destroyed by overfishing um, and by the extinction of species because there are, you know, too many fish being taken. Um, and as an example, McDonald's, when they introduced their fillet of fish in the 1970s, have now gone through six full species of fish because they've been fished out. There are no more of those species left. Um, so we are in danger of really doing harm to the planet because of intensive farming. So what, what's the solution to that? Well, everyone will be familiar with alternative milks, which are milks made out of plants. And, you know, that's almond milk, soy milk, rice milk, and oat milk, as, as some of you will know. Um, Oatly, which is the big Swedish company that makes oat milk, has recently gone public in the New York Stock Exchange to vast uh, acclaim. And uh, those alternative milks have gone from almost nothing 10 years ago to being nearly a quarter of the market, uh, even though they're not exact replicas of milk. And so in uh, the next 10 years, exact replicas of milk, it not involving any dairy cattle, so no emissions, no animal cruelty, no uh, contamination, etc., will take the market over. And I, I predict that in 10 years there will be no more dairy farming as we know it really anywhere except in very unusual circumstances. Um, and that's because of precision fermentation, which is the exact replica of milk that's being introduced to the market in the U.S. sometime either later this year or early uh, next year without any need for dairy cattle. That's the first, and that will apply to yogurts, cheeses, and any milk derivatives that we're familiar with. Mm. The second thing is that we're all familiar with Beyond Meat and Impossible Meat, Meatless Farms, corn, which are plant-based alternatives to conventionally farmed meats. And they've been doing very well, and they've been growing quickly and as a share of, uh, you know, the share of the meat market. But coming up quite soon are meats that are grown in laboratories that are exactly the same as the best in any species you want to name without antibiotics, without hormones, without animals being involved, except in a very uh, peripheral way and uh, being produced at quantity uh, and possibly cheaper than the meats that we're familiar with today. And that's happening now. So all the companies that are involved in this, uh, which agronomics invests in, have products already and they can replicate any species that you want and the best of the species. So if you want Aberdeen Angus meat, that can be made in a laboratory and it's exactly the same as Aberdeen Angus coming from a cow, except none of the contaminants, none of the antibiotics and the bad stuff. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, if I can briefly describe it, what you have is a small sample of, of blood is taken from a uh, a cow, as an example, it can be from a chicken or any, anything else. And that, in that sample, there are things called stem cells. And we, we all, all have stem cells as well, but all animals have them as well. The stem cells are the cells that give the instructions to uh, our bodies to develop different types of cells to make different parts of our bodies. So like muscle or fat or connective tissue or whatever. Those stem cells are extracted. They are fed effectively the same type of nutrients that a cow would eat in a field the stem the sample is as small as my or your little fingernails so it's a tiny sample the cow doesn't feel anything it goes back to chewing its grass and that stem cell sample will produce uh about three thousand kilos of beef in 40 days um and it'll be perfect um compared that to the equivalent of seven or eight cows, which would take 28 months to grow. So it's a revolution in prospect for the meat industry. And so not only do we have plant-based meats, we also now have the cell ag meats. And half of the meat market in 10 years will be produced by these two uh, types of activity. And it's happening really, really quickly. And then lastly, fish. Uh, our company, Blue Nalu, which is uh, partly owned by Agronomics, will be on the market with its first fish product grown in the lab by the end of this year. So this is happening really quickly. 
And fish, as we know, is full of microplastics, toxins, antibiotics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's you know the overfishing of oceans is a disaster. So um, it's happening. It's happening now. Agronomics is the world's biggest investor in the sector, um, and I feel it's got a really good future ahead of it. It's a company listed on the London Stock Exchange, as you're aware. Um, it just raised another bunch of money a couple of weeks ago. I'm the biggest shareholder. I really believe in it. And uh, uh, it was just the beginning of a very, very exciting journey. Yeah, I totally agree with Jim. It's very exciting. Jim, I know that you spend a lot of time in Ibiza and Isle of Man. And from what you said earlier about your how you grew up and living abroad, it, do you think this has shaped you into the person you are today? The fact that you've moved around from country to country and had lots of very interesting experiences very early on. Do you think that's helped you have perhaps be more open-minded than the average um, Oxbridge uh, graduate, dare I, dare I generalise? <laughs> I, I think that uh, I think there's pluses and minuses on either side. You know, you end up being a little bit rootless because you're constantly nomadic. But on the other hand, you do see a lot more. Um, of the world um, and uh, look, it just suits me um, I do recommend to any young person that they should leave the country and you know do something overseas for a little while at least yes um, and uh, so yeah I think it's just up to the individual frankly well there's a saying isn't there that, uh, that travel um, it opens the mind and when I say travel I don't mean uh, two weeks, you know, in, in a foreign country, just in the sun, but actually spending some time living there and working there. I, I, I did spend, it was only a few months after I left school, I did spend four months working in Germany uh, because I was a bit of a linguist at school and um, I speak German fluently then. I, I couldn't now because uh, it's such a long time ago, but I found it, it did expand my mind. And is that what you're finding? By, by the fact that you do you do spend time in different countries every year you don't just spend all your time in the uk yeah i think so and you know tony funny enough i spent a couple of months in germany as well working when i was uh, uh between school and university and I, oh, my german was okay it's better now actually funny enough because i do so much work in in germany um but i do think learning a language is really important i mean if anyone yes doesn't know it, but the Duolingo uh, app is really good, and I do 10 minutes every day on Spanish and 10 minutes on Arabic, believe it or not, which I'm learning at the moment. So <laughs> it also keeps your mind sharp. You know, it's important to do something like that. Well, isn't that one um, of the which you can improve your mental health into a very old age, you know, by trying new things, and learning languages is one of those key things, is it not? Yeah, I mean, they say that you should uh, try and learn a language or do a word puzzle or do a crossword or something like that. And indeed, my father is learning Italian at the moment at the age of 92, so it works for him. I can see why you're interested in longevity because you, you clearly, uh, it's there in your family. It's, it seems to be there in your genes. Um, I presume it's not the Well, only you never know. Uh, you never know. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, he, he seems quite happy, so... <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. So, um, Jim, based on your uh, successful career to date, uh, what advice would, would you give to any aspiring entrepreneurs and investors who are listening to today's show? What should they do? Well, I mean, it's very difficult because um, you rightly pointed out, Tony, that not everyone's suited to the entrepreneurial life. No. You know, if we were all entrepreneurs, there would be no one working in any companies. Um, you know, so um, I think you have to work out first if you are an entrepreneur, if you're just, you know, trying it out because your friends are doing it. Uh, it's not enough of a reason. The second thing is you've got to have some credible uh, business idea. Um, you know, you can't just be copying someone else because copying – uh, probably won't yield any results. Um, and But with that in mind, uh, I think there are huge opportunities for 
younger people or even not so young people to branch out on their own and do something at the moment. And we live in a country in the UK, which is probably, well, it, it's one of the most business friendly countries, believe it or not, in the world. And it's very easy to start a business. And because of all sorts of tax breaks, which you know, you're familiar with EIS and yes. PCTs and all this sort of stuff, there are, it's very easy, not easy, but if you've got a great idea, it's, makes it easier for you to get some money from uh, investors to help you start your business. And from a personal point of view, I would say, uh, why not look at the food revolution, see if there's something there that you could do that's different to other people, maybe where you could even get some intellectual properties or patents. Um, have a look there. Uh, I think it's going to be a very big industry and it suits the UK because we import half of our food. So it'd be really great if we could make all the food yes. here and have better food security. That, that would be an area that I would definitely uh, look at if I was a young um, entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, there are so many areas of opportunity. There's the energy replacement uh, opportunity the is the biotech opportunity um, so you don't need to go and start a sandwich shop or a barber shop or something like that I think that you know that's fine but um, there are, there's no it's very unlikely that you're going to make a huge fortune by doing that so uh, go where some sort of intellectual knowledge uh, is involved where you can play to your own personal strengths um, and just check that you really want to be an entrepreneur. You're prepared to work really hard and that, you know, this is your life's mission before yeah. you do it. Yeah. Jim, I, I was um, uh, typical of some of my age. I was uh, very much in favour of Brexit, but not because of the reasons that people throw at you for being racist and this, this nonsense. It, it was because I just felt that the EU was holding us back because it's, uh, it's very protectionist and it's very... Um, uh, uh, what's the word? Got a lot of red tape, etc. And I just felt that once we were outside the EU, it would free us up. Do you, do you share that view? Do you think that that will help release entrepreneurism uh, more without as many restrictions? What do you think? I completely agree with you, and I think there's already evidence of that. Um, I mean, we obviously point to the vaccination program as being more successful here than it was in Europe, but that's not a mean feat. I mean, you know. Having a home in Spain, I can see just how slow they were um, in comparison to the UK. And that was because of the centralization of uh, vaccine procurement. But there is a increasing evidence, I think, of uh, the UK's ability to probably do much better than the European Union over the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, it's not and I, I can see that. I mean, there were trade glitches to begin with. There's the spat over Northern Ireland. Um, there's their efforts to try and stop the progress of the city. Um, I don't think they're going to succeed in any of it. Um, I think protectionism doesn't work. No, the, company, the countries that are protectionists end up being poorer as a result. Um, I think we should just open our doors to enterprise uh, and... I would predict that within 20 or 30 years, uh, the UK will have done much better than most of the European uh, economies, uh, simply because we're freed of a lot of shackles. Yes, because of course, uh, the, the most successful countries in the world are the countries that have free trade, such as Switzerland, for example. Hugely successful. I once read that they've got three times as many trade deals with the rest of the world than the EU. I, it, I just thought, it's just simple, isn't it? If you've got more countries to trade with you've got more countries to sell to more countries to buy from so you can shop around more i know it's very simplistic but it's just an example of how you can do one well switzerland is a, it's a fantastic successful economy it is um you know i mean on a micro level the isle of man where my home is uh is has had now 36 years of uninterrupted economic growth and it has the fifth highest GDP per capita in the world as a result, an income per head about twice that of the UK. And in the 1950s, it was about half the level of the UK because yeah. it has a flat rate of tax. 
very easy entrepreneurship. It's, it navigates into different industries as they emerge um, and a very supportive government. And if we have all those factors here in the UK, you're going to find uh, an unleashing of enormous potential in this country, really. I've been saying to people I know that I see this as um, like the second leg of, of Great Britain. Uh, people might dismiss me as perhaps a little England, but um, I don't think so. I just think that it, it, it plays to our strengths of um, ingenuity, engineering, science, creativity. These are all national strengths. I think we can thrive. I really do. Um, it sounds like you agree. You agree with that. Where I do, and I think we might even win the uh, football tonight. I was just going to come on to that point. As we're coming close to the end of the show, it will be such a funny thing if we were to win the European Championships just after we left the EU. That would really make me laugh. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Tafina and I are going to watch it at home tonight. I, I, we were thinking about going to a pub, but it's just kind of. Uh, I think there'll be a bit. Uh, <laughs> it'll be a bit raucous. <laughs> I think Mars will be thrown out the window if we if we actually win it. It would be quite amazing. But um, yeah, it looks like yeah. Yeah, we've got every chance. Just got to believe. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Even though I'm a Scotsman, I'm, I'm very much for England. So um, <laughs> uh, uh, and and by the way, if I had to guess, I'd say there's absolutely no chance in the next twenty years of Scotland leaving the union um, because okay. you know every time that the the facts are examined, yes. um, it becomes apparent that they are much better off in the union than out of it. Yeah, I think it'd be a good idea if they would stay, but uh, they've got their right to vote to, to move out, to be fair, you know. But uh, anyway, Jim, it comes to, I'm sad it comes to the end of the show. I feel I could talk to you all day. It's just such an interesting uh, life you lead, and you've, you've given us a lot of uh, jewels today, so I really, really appreciate your time, and uh, I'm sure our listeners will have a fantastic time listening to you so i wish you all the best for the future and um yeah i'll keep following well, you I'll be, i hope to see i see, hope to see you both uh, yes. it sounds a bit final that but i hope to see you both <laughs> quite soon and and uh and obviously at the master investor show which yes, um yeah uh, which is coming up again and uh, we'll be able to celebrate in person and thank you so much for having me on your on your show you're very welcome jim have a great day uh, and bye for now Bye, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 This is Sonny Byrne presenting Money Demystified on Spectrum On Air, the colour of radio. Uh, just a short risk warning to the listeners today. This show is for general information only and is not intended to be individual advice. You are recommended to seek competent professional advice before taking any action.